give his best religion to them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadih al-ladhin astafa. La siyama al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama taslima kathira. My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of Gardens of the Pious. Today's episode is number 634. And it will be the third in studying chapter number 277. The prohibition of treachery and breaching one's covenant. <clears throat> All of that is still under the major title, the book of Al Umurun Manhi Anha, the book of the prohibited acts. We studied some very interesting hadith about threatening against breaching one's covenant and betraying and breaking one's promise. And today, inshallah, with the first hadith, 1586, which is a sound hadith and collected by Imam Muslim in his sound collection, may Allah have mercy on him. And it is rated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, radiyallahu anhu. Anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal, likulli ghadirin liwa'un inda istihi yawm al-qiyama, yurfa'u lahu bi qadri qadrih, ala ولا غادر أعظم غدرا من أمير عامة. So the messenger of Allah peace be upon him in this hadith said, everyone who breaks a covenant will have a banner by his bottom on the day of resurrection, and this banner will continue to be raised higher according to the nature of his breach and betrayal. Then he remarked, saying, Peace be upon him, Behold, there will be no greater sin with respect of breaking the covenant than one, than that of a ruler who breaks his covenant with the Muslim masses. It's very scary, but this hadith and similar hadith made the companions of the Prophet ﷺ maintain steadfastness on the straight path made the followers of the companions and their followers and made a lot of people until today they guard their word because of fearing of breaching a covenant that they have taken in the name of the almighty Allah so we have learned that for every breaching of a contract or a covenant with the intention of cheating deceiving or treachery there will be a banner what is the purpose of having a banner in the dunya? Behind me there is a banner, it says in Arabic, Riyadu Salihin, that is the name of the program. Okay, so it is distinguished from as Quda and Corrector Citation. The banner is to announce, to advertise, to declare, to distinct, to distinguish. On the Day of Judgment, imagine somebody who has many banners. Some will be by his bottom, some will be by his neck and some will be raised like in an umbrella above him where the masses of people on the day of judgment will get to see what is this for this is the betrayal of so and so this is the breaching of so and so exposed a scandal in front of everyone and we say there is a difference between somebody who have taken a covenant upon himself or signed a contract then he failed to fulfill it due to something out of his control, due to something which he did not choose to do it. Versus a person who at the time of signing the contract, his intention was to breach the contract. Whenever he made the promise, his intention that he was going to break the promise. Whenever he borrowed the money in the name of Allah and he signed the paper that I will pay back on that day, he actually intended not to pay back. Such person is ghadir. Ghadir, treacherer. Dishonest person. Because this is his habit, in addition to he was contemplating this idea before. So the Almighty Allah would treat him in accordance with his intention. If his intention was evil, 
then the outcome of his investment, of his covenant, of his business, of borrowing the money, would be ruining him, ruining his wealth, ruining his family. He will not benefit out of it. The benefit might be temporary, but in reality, he would not benefit out of it whatsoever. Similar to the hadith which we discussed, من أخذ أموال الناس يريد أداءها أدى الله عنه ومن أخذها يريد إتلافها أتلفه الله If this is your intention from the time you sign a contract with American Express, Visa, MasterCard, whatever We said it's not permissible for a Muslim to pay interest or to agree to pay interest But Sheikh, I live in the USA, I live in Canada, I live in the UK I cannot live without a credit card to rent a car, to pay the rent, to pay the utilities, I have to have a credit card. Okay, we said there is a concession, provided you link it to your account so that there will be direct withdrawal. Once you owe the money, the credit card company, whether it is the bank itself or an independent company, will make a direct withdrawal from your account. So this way, you're certain you will not pay any interest because you're not going to be late. You have the cash, but you needed the car to make the payment. On the other hand, I came across people who asked me, inquired, and they were certain what they were doing is perfectly legal. That they sign a contract and their credit balance is 100 grands. They build up a good credit until it becomes a couple hundred and more. And then they start using the card where they purchase gold, they purchase whatever they carry sell, or they take cash in advance, and their intention is not to pay back. Why not? Because those people are kuffar and non-Muslims. So they perceive their wealth, their money as lawful. You as a Muslim, whenever you sign the, the contract, whenever you sign the contract and you agree to pay back and you are capable to pay back, then this is theft. I was stealing from Jews. I was stealing from non-Muslims. It is still theft. During the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Jabir ibn Abdullah borrowed some dates and so on from a Jew. At the time of making the payment, he wasn't able to. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took some of his companions and he visited the Jew. And he literally begged him to postpone the due date. A couple more days, he will pay you. Now he's in, in, in financial uh, strain, he cannot pay. He insisted. He said, Ya Abel Qasim to the Prophet. I need my property now. I need my money now. And I'm not postponing a minute. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before I say what he did, I want you to imagine that Jew was living in a Muslim state and its ruler was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Jabir ibn Abdullah was one of the dearest companions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam simply could have ordered a warrant against the Jew to arrest him and to confiscate his wealth. Because look the way you're talking to the president, to the ruler. I'm letting you live in my country. I'm letting you live in my society. And now you're talking to me this way. Kick him out. Revoke his visa. No, no, no. The Jew owes the property. Jabir ibn Abdullah was supposed to pay on time, but he wasn't able to. When the Prophet وسلم, intervened, the Jew ref uh, refused, totally refused. He said, listen, I'm not accepting any intercession. I'm not accepting any excuses. I need my money now. And the Nabi وسلم, helped Jabir ibn Abdullah to settle his debt and pay it off. But when you look at it, yani the Prophet وسلم, didn't do anything to the Jew. He was very rude. And he's not Muslim. And he's living in a Muslim country. Yeah, but he's Mu'ahad. We gave him a covenant. You can live in our country. So you're safe. And no one can touch him. No one can dare to touch his wealth without right. No one can dare to speak ill about him without right. It's as simple as that. Whether a Jew, a Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, an atheist. So when you deal with people, you deal in accordance with your faith, not with their faith and what, not what they do, even to Muslims in 
their societies when Muslims are minorities. The other day, just a couple days ago, uh, the French president, somebody drew his image resembling the Dutch dictator Adolf Hitler. So he saw them because how dare you ridicule me? How dare you speak ill about me and resemble me to Hitler? So the guy, and he's not Muslim, the guy said, very strange. A few months ago, you addressed 1.8 billion Muslims and you said, we live in a free country. We live in a secular society. Anyone has the right to criticize and discredit anyone. So your prophet is no special. So you heard the feeling of 1.8 billion Muslims in the name of freedom of speech. And you encourage the Charles Abidu magazine to draw awful images of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the name of freedom of speech. So why are you suing me now? Because I drew your image resembling Adolf Hitler. It's called double standard. So this is very obvious, but we as Muslims, we do not treat people the way they treat others or they treat us with. We treat them in accordance to what Allah and what His Messenger, peace be upon Him, has guided us to treat people with. Subhanallah. When a munafiq was involved in theft and murder, and he managed to blame it on one of the Jews in the Muslim society in Medina. The Quran was revealed to prove the innocence of the Jew and to cast the blame on the munafiq who claimed to be Muslim. So the Quran was revealed to declare that Jewish person was innocent, yes, because this is justice in Islam. We as Muslims, we must read the Quran, we must learn it and benefit out of it. So we know how to deal with each other. We know how to deal with non-Muslims. We know how to deal with people whom we live as minority in their society. So under any circumstances, borrowing money from the credit card or utilizing the credit cards with the intention of ripping them off, not paying back in Islam, this is not permissible. And that's called ghadr because you contemplated this idea while they were giving you their money with the promise that you will pay back. Yes, it's a, uh, the promise is corrupt because of the interest. So the segment of the interest who said will overcome it by paying on time so you don't pay interest. But not paying at all and you are capable to pay, that's called ghadr. So every ghadr, every treacher on the day of judgment will have a banner. It will be sitting next to his barn then it will be raised in proportion with the level of the breach or the treachery, whether it was an intermediate one or really a huge one, such as uh, uh, the breaching which will be discussed in the following hadith, where every people will get to see it. Then the Prophet وسلم, declared that indeed the worst breaching of a covenant is the breaching of a ruler. Whenever he breaches his promise to the mass of Muslims. This man, Ibn Lutayba, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sent him to collect the zakah, al sadaqah So he did. And he put it before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was being very honest. He said, this is the zakah fund which I collected. And what about this, this package? He said, this is mine. It's for me. It's for you. How did you get it? They say, the guys give it to me as a gift. This clan, when they paid the zakah, they said, Ibn al-Utayba, this is for you. It's not from the sadaqah. The Prophet Sallallahu did not tolerate that. Nor did he correct him individually on a side. He climbed the member and he gave a khutbah and said, what is wrong with some of you when we hire him to do our job? Then he says, this is yours and this is mine. Why doesn't he stay in the house of his mother, the house of his father, and hang on to see who's going to give him a gift? It's as simple as that. I am as a patient 
when I visit you as a doctor, you're a pulmonist, you're a cardiologist, you're an internist. So I visit you because I trust you. I agree to pay 400 bucks, 500 bucks. That's a lot of money because you are an expert. Then after the diagnosis, you grab the pen and you started writing the prescription. When you write the prescription and you keep in mind that this pharmaceutical company demanded from you to write 500 of this drug, 500 prescriptions, and based on that, they will compensate you, they will reward you, they will give you a bonus. So you chose in the back of your mind. You chose to write this particular drug, even though there is a similar one have price or a quarter of the price of the one which you're writing down. And it is as effective. So you decided to write the more expensive one. Why? Not because the patient needs this one, not because of the consideration of drug-drug interaction or side effects or adverse effects. It's simply because the representative of this pharmaceutical company promised you, if you write 500, 600, We'll compensate you accordingly. We'll buy a Honda Civic. We'll take you on a tour uh, in Europe during the summer. Or, 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 or. We'll renovate your flat. We'll buy you a condo. Whatever the price is. This is called treachery. You betray the patient. You betrayed and you breached the contract between me as a patient and you as a doctor. But we didn't have a written contract. But we have a contract of honesty because when I decided to come and pay your secretary, the front desk, that much money in order to get checked upon by you and you're a specialist, you're a consultant, you should have been honest. You choose for your patient what suits the most in respect of what the pharmaceutical companies are demanding from you or what they are promising you with. Shall I give you another example? Why am I giving too many examples? Because many people when they hear that they think, or maybe they're busy, their wives at home with their children, so they hear this. They think, Alhamdulillah, I'm not among them. Now you need to check out yourself. You need to, che to check out your business and your dealing with people. And whether your earning is lawful or unlawful. It's not only about lawful and unlawful, it's also about breaching a contract. And as I just give the example of the physician and the patient, there is no written contract, but there is a known custom contract. That's why I visited you. I didn't go to the mechanic to tell him that I have some heart pain. I went to a cardiologist, right? I didn't go to an orthopedic doctor. I went to a cardiologist because of a pain in my heart, in my chest. So I trusted you. You should be trustworthy enough to write down the prescription which you think it is most perfect and most economical for the patient. Otherwise, then this person has betrayed the amana which the Almighty Allah entrusted him with. There is a job which is known as uh, the job of being in a charge of making purchases for the company, acquisition manager. So this guy is in charge of buying anything and everything for the company and making contracts. Here at our little studio, in order to produce a program like that, we would need a set and people will do it and the designers who need some items to be placed here and there. So we appoint somebody, we hire somebody to do this. He went and he purchased all these items and he presented a receipt. We paid him. This person before Allah is Mu'taman. When he goes to the marketplace to buy these items and to make the set, we hire them and we pay him a salary in order to get us the best value, the best product for the most economical price. But if somebody does the opposite, he gets whatever is in the market and meanwhile he strikes a deal with the seller, that if I buy from you, you will give me 10%, 15%, or you will give me that much. This money is unlawful, 
even if it is just a little gift even if he invites you for a meal where you guys sit together and eat shish kebab and uh, rip eye and you eat whatever the best seafood this is bribery because of that the acquisition guy is going to visit this guy often and make the purchase from him what did he do he betrayed he breached the contract between him and the employer whether it is a government sector or a private sector and this is very common subhanallah very common and on many different levels and scales a person whom you strike a deal with and he demands certain things if you change if you betray if you breach you are a ghadir and al ghadir will have a banner that will appear for him on the day of judgment and he will say what kind of breaching how bad was it and no one will enter jannah or nar before settling all of that whether a muslim or a non-muslim yani if a muslim have breached a contract with a kafir would the muslim just enter al jannah safely because he used to pray night prayer mashallah and the kafir is going to hell fire no a kafir will not enter hell fire before receiving his full right from that muslim who betrayed him this is in the hadith brothers and sisters so this is very serious if you are hired by the company if you are hired by the government as an acquisition manager then my job is to look for the best value the greatest product and the best price if you take anything from the seller even as a gift it is called not a gift it's rather called rishwa bribery so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best now I'm going to answer the question of some who would say oh yeah but you know even some ministers prime ministers minister of defenses interior ministers when they import weapons choppers tanks they make a big commission not like us in hundreds rather in hundreds of millions and this is very common and we all know that western countries manufacture weapons they do not necessarily use them they sell them to the fool and the fool do not utilize them to defend their holy lands no rather to oppress their people and they buy the weapons in excessive amount and they keep storing them in case that they need to use them against their own people or against their muslim neighbors and when they buy it is announced we strike a deal with whatever country with france with the uk with the usa with israel to buy 30 million 30 billion dollar worth planes choppers machine guns and in reality it was worth 15 billion what happened to the rest in his pocket whether he's a ruler a governor a king a sultan a president a prime minister a minister anyone so Nabi sallallahu sallam in this hadith said ala wala ghadira a'zam ghadran min amir amma yani the worst kind of breach in a contract is from a person who happens to be an emir in a charge of the affairs of the Muslims and he and he deceives them he betrays them whenever any of us is hired by the government from the highest rank to the lowest one who are being employed by the people nothing more than my salary is permissible for me my wife and my children should not be beneficiaries whatsoever of any benefit from my position why because the people hired me not my wife not my children as a result we see lack of accountability in many muslim countries lead simply to absolute corruption so we see people dying out of hunger we see people cannot afford the medication while we see people they don't know what to do with the money so they throw it right and left in buying unnecessary stuff like foolish for hundreds of millions for billions and if anyone dares to question them what is this for 
It's not your right. You're one of the public. You should be grateful that we are ruling you. So a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah, wala ghadira a'zamu ghadran min amiri amma. Have you ever heard of a ruler or a king or a sultan or a president or a pharaoh who lasted forever? No. And nowadays, when they say, oh, this dictator lasted in power for 30 years, then what is 30 years? What is after 30 years? What is after 30 years? Long waiting for accountability, betraying the people, deceiving the people whom you're looking after, whom you're ruling, would definitely book you a seat in hellfire. May the Almighty Allah protect us against that. That was a very interesting and uh, powerful hadith as well. It's time to take a short break and we'll be back in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. In this segment, I'm going to share with you our phone numbers and we'll be happy to take your questions and concerns inshallah soon after. Area code 002 then 0109 Alternatively, area code 002 then 01 The WhatsApp numbers, area code 001 And finally, area code 001 Nashim from the Philippines, Assalamu alaikum, Nashim. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Naam. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, Nashim. How are you? I am fine, alhamdulillah. I have two questions, Sheikh. Naam. Go ahead. This, this, this concern me. My first question, Sheikh, is I've read some authentic hadith which is it says disobeying your parents is one of the major sins mm. and my question is Sheikh if a person re rejected the proposal or the request of their parents to marry this person or that person do they get the sin from doing such a, such a thing for instance Sheikh uh, rejecting the proposal of their parents to okay. marry this person got your question Nasheed and, and my second question Sheikh uh, is it permissible in Islam for a daughter or son to reject this kind of proposal from their parents? Well, it is the same question though. Well, the Quran says that Allah has enjoined upon us to be kind and youthful to our parents. Then he said, فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما. So in addition to being obedient to them, be word. Never ever say off to them. And off isn't a word, but it's a gesture expressing your displeasure or discontent. You're not happy. It's haram to say to one's parents or any of them off. Okay, then it's a greater haram to offend them by any mean. Rather, one should say a noble statement to them. This is what Allah says in the Quran. What about if my parents propose a girl to me to marry or a guy to the girl to marry? But I don't like that guy. I don't like that girl. So I don't see any chemistry between us. I don't think that he can be my spouse or she can be my spouse. Am I blameworthy if I say no? The answer is no. That is not included in the obedience of the parents because it is you who's going to be in bed with this person. But you should express that nicely, smartly, without offending them. But it is not permissible to force neither you nor a girl to marry in a person again is their will. Okay? Nashim from the Philippines. Thank you. Bismillah. Saeed from Australia. Assalamu alaikum, Saeed. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you, Sheikh? Wa alaikum, Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Huda TV, Saeed. Go ahead. Thank you, Sheikh. Sheikh, um, I live in Australia, Sheikh. And um, because there are a lot of haram jobs in Romania, so it's a bit confusing for me to choose uh, if the job is halal or haram. 
And the lo- local scholars who I know personally, when I speak to them, Sheikh, uh, I mean, uh, they say almost every job is halal. For example, if I'm serving alcohol, they say it's halal because you're not drinking it. So it's coming to me. Maybe they're right, I don't know, but they have a very lenient to me. So because I watch your Lord, Sheikh, I want your advice. Saeed, Saeed, Rasulullah, peace be upon him, said, إن الله إذا حرم شيئا حرم ثمنه. If Allah forbids this drink, then its price is unlawful. If Allah forbids this food, then its price is forbidden. Its price is forbidden means I'm not allowed to sell it, I'm not allowed to buy it, I'm not allowed to serve it even to non-Muslims. It's as simple as that. There is no difference of opinion in this regard, Saeed. People who tend to make things not easy, rather lose, have ended up with a different religion than the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you, Saeed from Australia. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Hiba from Qatar. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah shaykh. Uh, I just had a clarification to make from yesterday's question regarding the rights of the foster mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, by foster mother, I meant uh, foster mother by breastfeeding. Like they do the five step thing and the relationship, breastfeeding uh, relationship is established. So uh, I want to know the rights of the children and the mother in this case. Tayyib, uh, Hiba, uh, well, it's not really called a foster mother. Rather, the term that Allah the Almighty expressed about it in Ayah number 23, chapter number 4, وَأُمَّهَاتُكُمُ اللَّاتِي أَرْضَعْنَكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ مِنَ الرَّضَاعَةِ So the mothers who suckled you, so she happened to be a mother if she happened to suckle the baby before the age of weaning for at least five separate fulfilling times. So she has become ummun min al The relationship between the child who's been suckled by this woman for five times at least, maybe more, 50, 500 is two years, okay, is al mahramiya And again, whatever I said yesterday applies here. Even if this mother was hired like Halima Sa'diyya, okay, the Prophet Sallallahu was loyal to everyone especially those who have offered him any service, like his mother through suckling, Halima as okay? But it will not be the same right like a foster mother who raised you, even if she didn't breastfeed you, or a real mother who gave birth to you and raised you, because due to that, you have an access to see them on a regular basis. As they grow old, you should look after them, take care of them, they are your parents. إِنَّ يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Whether your real mother or the person who fostered you and looked after you. But just wanted to correct the term. It is rather الأم من الرضاع. Thank you. Hiba from Qatar. Nida from the case. Hey, welcome to Huda TV, Nida. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa Go ahead. My my question is regarding the vaccine. Here in Saudi, we have um, this option of taking either either the Pfizer or the um, AstraZeneca. Mm. And the the problem is that uh, my husband he says that he knows uh, quite a few colleagues um, at work and also he has a friend uh, a well-known sheikh over here who has said he has been to uh, he has uh, been to the genaz of seven people who had died after the vaccine mm-hmm. but we don't know what we're supposed to do if we should take uh, yeah. the vaccine we're, or not yeah Sister Nida, your question is is a valid question, but unfortunately it is asked to the wrong person. Why? Because I'm not offering medical advices here. And to be very honest with you, 
Irrespect of the COVID-19 and its new variants, Delta and so on, yesterday I was listening to Dr. Fauci, the specialist and the advisor to the White House, the head of the team, where he was saying that they, they grilled them right on air. Uh, irrespect of the new variant Delta, where he said that it is a thousand times greater and uh, more dangerous than the regular COVID-19. And then he advised everyone who was double vaccinated to still wear the mask and take the precautions. So it seems like they're going into a lockdown again. A person like me or a sheikh will speak about the power of Allah and human beings should show humility before Allah and begging for forgiveness. But when it comes to the medical advices, the experts themselves are confused. And anyone would say other than that, he is deceiving himself. Because I watch closely the medical reports and the interviews, whether by the Congress or the Senate to the medical advisors, and where we find out there is nothing solid. It's all estimates or approximately. So they advise those who are double vaccinated with Pfizer to take another extra dose of uh, AstraZeneca or those who are double vaccinated with this to take an extra dose of uh, another uh, company and so on. At least in these countries, the vaccination is for free versus in, in many Muslim countries where you have to pay arm and leg in order to get it. But to give you an advice to take it or not to take it, well, I can assure you from watching the news and following the medical reports, yes, hundreds of those who have been double vaccinated still got infected. Many of them died, as you just said, your husband attended the funeral of seven people who were double vaccinated. May Allah have mercy on them. But in the light of what we hear from all the doctors, the vaccination is better. And I'm sure most of the physicians who speak about that, they are just repeating what they hear from the old health organizations or what is coming from the medical advisors of the White House. We, all of us, we don't have an access to verify that or to confirm that. So at that, I would say, what they say, it is recommended to take it. But whether to take it or not to take it, it's definitely your choice. I cannot give you a medical advice in this regard, to be honest with you. Thank you, sister. Uh, forgot the name. From the KSA. Nida from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Irbaz from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Salam, Sheikh. How are you? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah, Irbaz. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, I'm. Uh, my, uh, you 15 years old. I go to high school in America. I haven't started with yet. Yeah, Airbus, uh, unfortunately, your connection is not really clear. I didn't catch any of your question. You want to try so with a different line? Have, Airbus, didn't do you catch? have any... Can you convey the message to Airbus? We didn't catch anything of your question due to poor connection. Please try again. Check out another line. Assalamu alaikum. Salheen from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Salheen. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is uh, if my uh, if my employer doesn't want me to use my personal cell phone at uh, my workplace while I'm working and uh, I do use the cell phone, will it fall under treachery like uh, you mentioned in the hadith today? And my second question is uh, regarding Sayyidul uh, Istighfar. Uh, the line wa ana ala ahdika wa ahdika mastata. Uh, what is the uh, uh, ahdika and wa ahdika is referring to? Taib, wait a minute, Salheen. In respect of your first question, your employer is restricting the use of uh, your personal cell phone on the premises or at work. Am I correct? Isn't this your question? Yes, that's that's the, that's the question. And then, do you stick to that, or you still breach the uh, the commitment? Right. Right, what? Uh, so like I, I, so they say we cannot use our personal mobile phone, but we uh, use the mobile phone anyway. And uh, the 
they know that? Do they let you use it? So, uh, no, they, they, if they catch us, so, uh, they will, uh, you know, uh, discipline us, but we uh, okay. you know, sneak and whatever. And we thank you, thank you, Salhi. Well, well, it's very obvious in this condition. When I, uh, when I had an interview with the company or the employer, they threw their conditions and I agreed to them. So that's a covenant. I should commit myself to it. Obviously, because the use of cell phones on the premises of work uh, has wasted billions of dollars from the wealth of the employers or the companies or even the government sectors. Uh, we all see that, particularly in our countries where there is a long queue standing before the guy and when he reach to his desk and he's too busy so he's making people seem uh, think that he's working on the computer while he has in his drawer his phone and he's playing a game he's so obsessed with the game that he's not paying attention to the long queue before him so when the employer regulates that and said look if anyone wants to reach you on the uh, on the work landline you're most welcome in case of emergency fine and during the break there is a lunch break there is a coffee break you can use your phone actually that makes sense so if you agreed not to use a phone on premises not to use a phone while working then you should stick to your commitment and wallah it will give you a break it's much better thank you uh, Salheen from Canada assalamu alaikum Muhammad from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, so I just have two small questions. Um, my first question is, say someone is in a situation where they thought they prayed salah on time, but then they realized after they didn't pray on time, um, they prayed with the intention of reading that specific salah, but they realized they didn't make it on the specific time frame. Mm. And does that person have to repray their salah, or is it a, is it okay like the salah they pray? Well, the answer is they don't have to redo the salah. Okay, your second and question. My second question. My second question, Sheikh, is more is more um, is more leaning towards men. I guess, for example, um, for men specifically in Salah, right? Um, say, for example, they like it's not like intentional, right? It's say, for example, men they have like, um, I guess, coming from the, I guess, like they're covering their aura properly, right? Mm -hmm. But they can, I guess, like from their private area, there's like you can. Like it's covered properly, but it's more there. You could see like a bulge or something. Like it's like perfectly covered properly. Well, but it's like that is that is sometimes that's why it is not covered properly. L wearing loose clothes is required in order to cover up. So that bulging is exposing one's aura. Okay, why do we say to women it's not permissible to wear tight clothes? because it describes the curves and the details of the body. And what does this mean to you as a man? It's tempting, it's seducing, right? It's attractive, that's normal for normal people, okay? So you say, no, you should wear loose clothes. So for the underclothes, tight as much as you want. But for the outer part, the trousers, the thobe, the suit, it must be loose, not describing the details of the undergarment. Thank you. Muhammad from Canada. Barakallahu feek. Assalamu alaikum. Hisham from the USA. Assalamu alaikum, Hisham. Hisham, can you hear me? Yeah, Hisham? I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, Layla from Russia. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Layla. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Huda TV, Layla. Yeah, so I'd like to ask you that my parents just want me to get married and to born three kids, but I'm a feminist and I don't want to get married and just want to live my life. Is it permissible in this 
Islam. So how can I get it? How well, can I? Let me ask you, Layla. What do you mean by saying feminist? Not fem no, feminist does not necessarily mean that not uh, to get married. Okay. Yeah. Right. I just don't want to get married, but my parents doesn't allow me to live my life. How old are you, Layla? I'm thirty. You're 30, and you are perfectly at a marriageable age. Well, mm -hmm. if you don't want to get married, and if you don't have a desire to get married, it's permissible not to get married. But I would mm -hmm. really advise you as your elder brother, not as a sheikh. I've come across a mm -hmm. lot of sisters like you. When you hit the 40, you're going to regret. When you get the, hit the 45, you regret more. And then you would say, Sheikh, do you know somebody who's willing to marry me because I feel very lonely? In our youth, mashallah, you're still young. You have a lot of things to do. But at one point, you need to go home where parents are not there anymore. You don't have anyone but the husband and the children. It's very lovely. You know, especially if you happen to hook up with the right guy to find the right life mate, the person whom you love and you love you. It's not only about the intimacy, it's about having a friend. It's about having somebody to talk to. It's about having somebody when you're having fever in the middle of the night, he would rush to give you uh, antipyretic and give you the water, the, give you the medicine and pray for you. You know, I would share with you one hadith which will make you love to get married. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, May Allah brighten the face of a woman who will get up at night to pray night prayer. And then instead of praying by herself, she would uh, wake up her husband. And if he doesn't want to wake up, she would wet her fingers with water and sprinkle water over his face. Honey, get up. We want to pray at night. So when he got up and they both pray, Allah the Almighty will record them among al-zakirin Allah kathiran wa zakirat who would have the highest place in paradise. Marriage is not only about sharing bed. There are a lot of beautiful meanings in respect of marriage. Trust me, it's a matter of a few years where if you decide to remain unmarried, it's perfectly permissible. But unfortunately, it will come with a lot of remorse and regret. This is, as I said, an advice from your elder brother, not from a sheikh, if you know what I mean. So if you take your parents' advice, provided you meet the guy whom you like and you accept to marry the person whom you think you want to spend the rest of your life with, this is better. If you decide to stay unmarried, khalas, may Allah bless you and take it easy on you. Thank you, Layla from Russia. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to be able to take a... Uh, any further calls, but I want to share with you some good news. Uh, last week, there was one sister from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who wrote on the Facebook that she was watching the program and she said she's interested in learning more about Islam and accepting Islam. Uh, so I directed her information to one of my students, and she's a girl, and she's been in touch with her, alhamdulillah, and yesterday she took Shahada. And she wrote to me while she was on her way to the masjid. So congratulations to the sister. May Allah uh, preserve you and keep you steadfast on the straight path. And you brothers and sisters, try to spread the goodness and share their word by sharing this message. It doesn't really mean much for us. How many people are watching? How many likes? How many shares? But in reality and practically speaking, it means a lot. Because the more people... Uh, they watch this program or any other uh, beneficial program, the greater the possibility to have people more rightly guided, hopefully, inshallah. Cows, fire and stones 
selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price Thank you.